Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman as we continue our coverage of Hurricane Sandy. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission has acknowledged the massive storm could impact coastal and inland nuclear plants. At least 16 plants are in the storm's projected path, including North Anna and Surrey in Virginia, Calvert Cliffs in Maryland, Hope Creek and Salem in New Jersey, Indian Point in New York, Millstone in Connecticut. So far, there have been no reports of reactors shutting down, despite operating under licenses that require them to do so if weather conditions are too severe. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission met on Sunday to discuss the precautions needed to secure vulnerable plants during the storm. Spokeswoman Diane Skranke said, quote, they're all designed to withstand the natural phenomena, including hurricanes and what comes with hurricanes, high winds, high water, that kind of thing. Well, for more, we go now to Burlington, Vermont, to speak with Arnie Gunderson, former nuclear industry senior vice president, who's coordinated projects at 70 nuclear power plants around the country, now chief engineer at Fairwinds Associates. Arnie Gunderson, welcome to Democracy Now! Talk about what you're concerned about. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, the, the key here is that when a uranium atom splits, that only gives off about 95% of the power. So when these plants shut down, 5% of the power is still going to come out of the power plants after they're shut down. I think the industry should preemptively shut down plants in the storm's wake, but it's not going to solve the, the entire problem. It's really likely that the grid, the electric grid that, that's out there, will collapse, and these plants will become islands. Um, electric islands, and they, uh, they'll have to rely on their diesel generators to provide power. A bunch of these plants are in refuelings right now, and when you're in a refueling outage, you are not required to have all your diesels running. You can be tearing apart one and only have one diesel on, uh, available. So the concern is that should they lose off-site power, all of this heat needs to be removed and you're relying on just one diesel to keep the, uh, the nuclear reactor cool. Can you talk about um, what you feel needs to happen right now and talk about nuclear power plants in Connecticut and Vermont, your main concern? Yeah. The, the biggest problem, uh, as I see it right now, is the Oyster Creek plant, uh, which is on Barnegat Bay in, um, in New Jersey. That appears to be right about the, the center of the storm. Oyster Creek is the same design, but even older than Fukushima Daiichi uh, Unit 1. Um, it's in a refueling outage. That means that all the nuclear fuel is not in the nuclear reactor, but it's over in the spent fuel pool. And in that condition, there's no backup power for the spent fuel pools. So if Oyster Creek were to lose its offsite power, and, and then, frankly, that's really likely, um, there will be no way to cool that nuclear um, fuel that's in the fuel pool um, until they get the power reestablished. Nuclear fuel pools don't have to be cooled by diesels per um, the old Nuclear Regulatory Commission regulations. I hope the N Nuclear Regulatory Commission changes that and forces the industry to cool its nuclear fuel pools as well. This time of year, there's a lot of power plants in refueling outages, and um, all of those plants will be in a situation where there's no fuel in the nuclear reactor, it's all in the fuel pool, systems have been shut down to be maintained, including diesels, perhaps even completely dismantled, and um, uh, in the event that there's a loss of offsite power from the high winds from this hurricane, um, uh, we will see the, um, the water in the fuel pools begin to heat up. Neil Sheehan, a representative of the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory uh, Commission, um, said these plants have to be able to withstand all sorts of natural phenomena, earthquakes, severe flooding, tropical storms, lightning storms, tornadoes, they need to be able to deal with all that. We like to say they're very robust structures, they can deal with a lot of punishment, but at the same time they have procedures in place to guide them through this. So then, uh, Arnie Gunderson, what is your concern? 
You know, this isn't like um, like the big bad wolf that can huff and puff, and, and they won't blow this plant down, uh, especially a, a hurricane that's only 85 mile an hour winds. It's not a question of the winds from this hurricane um, blowing the plant down. It's a question of the loss of offsite power. That's exactly what happened after Fukushima Daiichi. The earthquake uh, destroyed the offsite power. At that point, the nuclear plant relies on its diesels. And um, uh, my, my big concern is diesel reliability and the fact that um, nuclear plants don't have to cool their nuclear fuel pools off their diesels uh, per NRC regulations. I think those are the, the, the two big concerns for, um, for Hurricane Sandy. Tell us what's happening in Vermont. Tell us what's happening with Vermont Yankee, Arnie Gunderson, a plant you know well. Yeah, um, Irene hit Vermont Yankee pretty hard, and um, the, we are expecting a little less rain from uh, Sandy than we were from Irene. Uh, it was interesting, talk about the law of unanticipated consequences. Um, there was so much flooding in Vermont that large gas canisters that people had in their backyard to, uh, to heat their homes or heat their trailer parks or to heat their, uh, their barbecues went floating down the Connecticut River. And and bumped into a, um, a hydroelectric dam, which is just south of Vermont Yankee. And the state police actually blocked off the road heading into Vermont Yankee because they were afraid all the hydrogen in those canisters uh, was likely to explode. Now, that's not in the design bases of a nuclear power plant. Nobody ever thought that, um, that we'd have to worry about explosive gases floating down rivers uh, by our nuclear plants and potentially uh, uh, causing damage. Um, here in Vermont, I think we'll have a less severe event near our nuclear plant than we had last year, uh, but it really depends on the degree of the flooding. What are the most important issues we can learn from Fukushima um, right now in the United States, and how does climate change fit in with both? Arnie Gunn. Uh, well, climate change has, has affected nuclear plants this year. Uh, quite a few had to reduce power in the summer because river flow rates had dropped and there wasn't enough water to cool them. And that happened in France and around the world as well. So we portray nuclear power as a way to eliminate climate change, but in fact, we need to solve climate change before we can have nuclear power plants because there's just not enough cooling water uh, to cool these plants in the event of hot summers. Well, now in the fall, and, and the lesson from, from Daiichi is that um, the, the nuclear fuel pools are, um, are a major uh, liability. There's more nuclear, um, uh, more cesium in the fuel pool at Vermont Yankee than was ever exploded in all of the 700 above ground bomb testing. I think the most important lesson we can take out of um, the Fukushima Daiichi in climate change and especially with Hurricane Sandy, is that we can't expect to cool these fueling pools. We need to remove the fuel. We need to put it in dry casks and get it down from these high fuel pools, get it down onto the ground in, uh, in dry cask storage. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission is not insisting on that because it's going to cost a couple billion dollars for the industry.
Com. Elsewhere today, a big earthquake in B.C. is causing a big concern for us down here in Washington. It triggered tsunami warnings for Hawaii. And had scientists looking for signs of activity in our volcanoes. King 5's Glenn Farley on what happened and why the worry. Earthquake. The quake got everyone's attention. It was hard to miss. In this sparsely populated part of British Columbia, there was actually little reported damage. It was the tsunami warning for Hawaii that frightened Karen Pasale, who was heading home to Portland through SeaTac. I had never heard the sirens before. Uh, they were going off, and you could hear them all over town. There was a small tsunami, but don't let the lack of damage or the size of the waves fool you. For scientists, this quake was a very big deal. How earthquakes trigger more earthquakes. John Vidali is the seismologist for Washington State. And across our state, the quake showed up everywhere on instruments. This big swath recorded all the way over by Grand Coulee Dam, including one of the more than 130 aftershocks. It's probably the thing that most likely to stir up activity around here in a long time. What concerns Vidali is this aftershock, symbolized on the map by a yellow box on a map more than 100 miles south of the epicenter. We just have to watch the whole region for a while uh, with extra care. The coast of British Columbia, like the coast of Washington and Alaska, is under tremendous geological pressure coming in from the Pacific. But now that a large amount of stress in the Queen Charlotte Fault is relieved, that adds to the stress on our faults. So now we're just keeping our eyes open because the stresses have been uh, changed. And that leaves Vidali and his colleagues on alert for the next several months, maybe even for years. In Seattle, Glenn Farley, King 5 News. Vidali thinks one tiny quake in Montana may have been set off by the big B.C. quake.